Well, the poles and zeros of a system give us a lot of information about the nature of the impulse response of that system. So we're going to look at how the poles and zeros determine the impulse response as well as what they can tell us about the transient response of the system. We know that if we have a linear time invariant system described by a constant coefficient difference equation that the system function h of z, which is y of z divided by x of z, can be expressed in terms of the coefficients of the difference equation as this rational function, where in the numerator we have the sum from k equals 0 to m, bk, z to the minus k, and in the denominator we have the sum k equals 0 to n, ak, z to the minus k. We also know that the impulse response is the inverse z transform of the system function. So if I take h of z, the system function, and try to invert it, well, this is a, as a ratio of polynomials in z inverse, we're going to use a partial fraction expansion to do the inverse. So I can write the denominator of h of z as a coefficient a0 times a product k equals 1 to n, 1 minus dk, z inverse. So the dk are the poles of the system. And if I invert this, remember if m is greater than or equal to n, we have to do long division to get it so that the numerator order is less than the denominator order. And so I have a term here that's associated with the long division, and that's going to be the sum r equals 0 to m minus n of b sub r, z to the minus r, for some coefficients b sub r. And then I'll have a sum of terms associated with poles that are not repeated. So here I have from k equals 1 to n1, ak, 1 minus dk, z inverse. And then we'll have poles that have a multiplicity of 2. So those will give rise to terms of sum k equals n1 to n2, ck, dk, z inverse over 1 minus dk, z inverse squared, and so on if we have higher multiplicities for the poles. Well, we can invert each of these terms in the partial fraction expansion, and the terms resulting from the long division just go to impulses that are located at r. So we have b sub r, delta of n minus r. Then the first order poles produce terms dk to the n u of n, and here we're assuming the system is causal. And then the second order poles produce terms of the form ck n dk to the n u of n. So what we see is that if we have an rth order pole at 0, b sub r, z to the minus r, that's going to produce an impulse term, b sub r, delta of n minus r. A single pole at dk produces ak times dk to the n u of n. A double pole at dk produces ck n dk to the n u of n. So depending on the nature of where the poles are located, we get these characteristic terms in the impulse response. Here's a simple example. Let's suppose that we expanded h of z and could write it as 2z to the minus 2 plus 1 over 1 minus 3 fourths z inverse plus 1 half times negative 1 half z inverse over 1 plus 1 half z inverse squared. So we have a single pole here at z equals 3 fourths, a double pole at z equals minus 1 half, and the impulse response would be 2 delta of n minus 2 plus 3 fourths to the n u of n plus 1 half n times the quantity negative 1 half to the n u of n. So the behavior of the impulse response depends entirely on the location of the pole that's making a contribution to it and its multiplicity. And we'll look at some of those contributions here in a moment. Clearly the poles at zero are particularly simple because it's just a single impulse at location r. The poles at locations dk in the z-plane other than zero produce these exponential type terms and those have characteristic shapes. So let's start with a single real pole where I have 1 over 1 minus a z inverse. So when I say the pole is real, that means that A is a real number, lies the, for the pole lies on the real axis. We know that this term has an inverse Z transform of A to the N U of N. I can plot the pole zero form here. We've got a pole 
here at A, which is about 0.8, and then we have 0 at 0, and you can see that the impulse response term associated with this pole has a characteristic decay of an exponential. On the other hand, if the pole is on the negative real axis, then we have this exponential decay, but we also have alternation in sign. Now, if I put the pole on the real axis, when the pole is at z equals 1, I get a step function for my impulse response. If the pole is at z equals minus 1, I'm going to have 1, minus 1, 1, minus 1, 1, minus 1. It oscillates every other sample. Now, if I were to choose the magnitude of A greater than 1, then I have a pole outside the unit circle, and of course the system is not going to be stable. Here's a case where the pole is on the positive real axis. You see that you have this growing exponential for the impulse response. If the pole is on the negative real axis and outside the circle, we also get a growing impulse response, but it has this alternation in sign. Now, if I have a second order real pole, then I have a multiplication by n. So I'm going to have n a to the n. Here, I've shown a double pole at z equals 0.8. And what you find is that initially you have some growth, which is due to the n factor. And then eventually the a to the n kicks in and the decay associated with a to n is faster than the growth associated with n. So we get this rising and then falling type of impulse response. Similarly, if I have the pole on the negative real axis, then we have the same envelope, but the sign alternates with each sample. If I put the pole on the unit circle at z equals 1, and I put a double pole there, then my a is equal to 1 in this particular case, so I'm just going to have n u of n. You see that the impulse response just has this ramp associated with n. This is an unstable system, as is when I put the pole at z equals minus 1. We also have a ramp, it's just the sign alternates. Now another case that we should look at is when we have a complex conjugate pair of poles. So I have poles at r e to the plus or minus j omega naught. Now each of those poles is going to produce a term that looks like r to the n e to the j omega naught to the n. And then for the other pole, we're going to have r to the n e to the minus j omega naught to the n. So this is a complex sinusoid, e to the j omega naught n, and r to the n is an exponential decay. So we're going to have an exponentially damped complex sinusoid for each of those poles. And if I have those poles combined in the right way, then I'm going to get a cosine term, or possibly a sine term, or possibly both a cosine and a sine term. So the special case that I'm going to illustrate here is when the z transform is of the form 1 minus r cosine omega naught z inverse over 1 minus 2r cosine omega naught z inverse plus r squared z to the minus 2. This has poles at r equals e to the plus or minus j omega naught, and the numerator is chosen such that the inverse z transform only has the cosine term. So here's a pole zero plot. We see that there's poles near the circle here as I put them. The angle of these poles is at omega naught equals pi over four. And you can see that I have an oscillation associated with the cosine of pi over four n. Then I also have this sort of exponentially decaying envelope associated with r. Now if I move these poles so that the magnitude of r is equal to 1, in other words I put them on the circle, then I have this oscillation only associated with the cosine because the r to the n terms go away here and we're left with the cosine. Of course that's not going to be a stable system as well because the impulse response won't be absolutely summable. So the pole locations tell us a lot about the nature of the impulse response. And one additional fact that comes out of this is if we think about the transient response time of the system. How fast does the system respond to changes? And this is reflected in the duration of the impulse response, which of course is also associated with the locations of the poles and zeros. So if I consider putting in a step to the system, which would be representative of a sudden change at a certain instant in time. I can write 
the step u of n as the sum of k equals minus infinity to n of delta of k. For n less than zero, my impulse hasn't come on yet, so those values are all zero, and then once n hits zero and everywhere after that, the sum of the delta is just one. So I've got zero jumping to one. Well, and because the system is linear, we know that a sum of inputs leads to a sum of outputs. So the step response, how the system responds to this kind of a sudden change, is going to be just the sum from k equals minus infinity to n of h of k. We're looking at the impulse response and how quickly the values in that impulse response sum to a particular number determines the step response or how fast the system responds to a step. If we have poles near the origin, then of course the terms at those poles are going to contribute. Remember, we're going to have um, r to the n, if r is the radius of the pole, then when the poles are close to z equals zero, r is small and this number decays really fast, so n doesn't have to get very big before the step response becomes constant and steady state. On the other hand, as the poles get close to the unit circle, then r is a number that's close to 1, and r to the n takes a long time to decay, and it will consequently take a long time for our step response to settle in. I've got an illustration of that here where I've got two systems. In one case, I put the poles at radius of 0.9, and you can see how the step response of the system at time zero, it starts to respond, and then we've got this oscillating behavior associated with the fact these poles are generating an oscillatory impulse response. So when I add those up, it eventually converges to some value, but it takes it a while. In contrast, if I put the poles cl relatively close to the origin, this is at r equals 0.25, the impulse response of this system is going to decay very rapidly, and consequently the step response is also going to converge very quickly to its steady state condition. So systems that have poles near the unit circle generally are going to take longer to respond to transients than systems that have poles which are close to the origin. And that's also consistent with the bandwidth of such systems because normally poles near the unit circle imply a narrow band system whereas poles near the origin are going to be more associated with a less resonant frequency response or a more broadband system. With the broader bandwidth the system can respond faster whereas with a narrow bandwidth it takes longer. So all these things tie together and the relationships between the impulse response and the frequency response and the pole locations all are consistent.